We say that with our lips, but do we believe it in our hearts tonight? We turn on the news, and it's all this sickening. Absolute. But you know what? When I turn to God's Word, my, 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 how much hope is in between the pages of that precious book? They may may not be no hope around us, but I'm glad that I still have hope within me. Somebody praise Him for the hope that's within us. Listen.
Mary Grace, you're going to have to go back there and help me out here. Uh, something's locked up. Judges chapter 4 and verse number 1. We may have to just be old school tonight and read it right there uh, off the pages of the Word. Judges chapter 4 and verse number 1. Judges chapter 4 and verse 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them uh, into the hand of Jabin. Uh, verse number two. Do I have somebody back there? And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, uh, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. Verse number three. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron and 20, uh, excuse me, 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Verse number four said, And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of uh, Lapithoth, uh, she judged Israel at that time. Verse five, the last verse we'll read. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, God, as we uh, look into your word, I ask you, God, that you'd help us. Lord God, may we receive uh, that that you have for us, that that you purpose for us uh, in this hour, in this time. We thank you, God, for all you have done. And Lord God, what you will do, uh, we love you, we bless you. Oh, we ask these things in the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. Uh, we continue this uh, as we look through the book of Judges. Tonight uh, we go into chapter number four. And uh, I had told someone here a few weeks ago uh, that we would be dealing with uh, this subject. And uh, we have got uh, to uh, the judge named Deborah. Uh, I want you to just uh, to get your attention and remember uh, where we are and where we were. Uh, Ehud, uh, the Bible said uh, there in verse number one, uh, that when after Ehud had died, uh, they had, they go and do evil uh, in the sight of the Lord after that Ehud is dead. Uh, verse number, uh, chapter 3, I don't have this uh, uh, back there, so you don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to make mention of it. Uh, Moab is subdued under the hand of Israel, and for 80 years while Ehud was judging uh, and was leading, uh, they had um, peace, and they, they had some, uh, they were able to live for God. They chose to follow the things of God, but now uh, in verse number one, we're introduced to a situation where now Ehud is dead. Give me uh, the first point there. As we look at Deborah uh, tonight, uh, we, we enter into a time of spiritual decline in the life of Israel. There's a time where Israel uh, all of a sudden is not doing what they should be doing as their, their custom has been, as the cycle uh, goes. There's a time of spiritual decline. Uh, after Ehud has, has died, uh, now they started to go after the things of the world. Uh, they have to. They started to go and to do things that they uh, were told not to do. They began to go after other gods, and they. Uh, the Bible says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter five said they chose new gods. Uh, they no longer have Ehud 
to direct them, to guide them, to give them truth, and they wander from the path uh, of, uh, of that they knew, the path that they uh, had uh, walked in in days gone by. I think about this. I think about how many times that uh, we see the same thing happening uh, in our churches uh, in nowadays. Uh, they'll, people will live for God for a while. Uh, they'll go on for God seemingly for a while, and then something happens, uh, and they leave the things of God. They leave the teaching of God. They leave the uh, the principles of God's Word. They, they leave it all. And maybe I've seen this many times. I'm thinking of, of several people right now uh, that I know well uh, that because after the death of a loved one in their life, they fell away from the things of God. Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent or maybe it's a special relative, but now they're dead, now they're gone, and they're no longer walking in the things of the Lord. It's a sad situation. It's a sad circumstance. Sometimes it happens when a preacher uh, leaves the church. The preacher leaves uh, and the people will scatter. This ought not to be. Um, if your faith and trust is in me, uh, you don't have very good faith or trust because I can tell you right now, this preacher will let you down. I'm going to do my best to live for God. I'm going to do my best to do the right things. Uh, but there's going to be times that I fail God. There'll be times that I fail you. There will be times uh, that I, I don't do the right thing. But can I tell you, there's a God that will always do right. There's a God that's always worth following. There's a God when everybody else leaves you and everybody else lets you down. There's one that, hey, hey, there's one that will always be there. The Bible said this, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I'm here to tell you, child of God, don't get your eyes on man this way, but look up. Look up to God. He'll never let you down. A time of spiritual decline as we notice their corruption, as we notice not only that they had become corrupt. But we notice uh, in verse number two and following that God has some chastisement for them. And the Lord sold them, verse two, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't well, I may have that up in the thing, don't worry about it. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Caesarea, uh, which dwelt in Harosheth of the Gentiles. And the Lord sold them into the hand of this wicked king. He says, all right, if you're not going to do what I've taught you to do, what I've told you to do, if you're going to go against the things of God, you're going to go against the ways of God, uh, then I will judge you. I know that's not a popular message, uh, but it's still the Bible truth. If you go against God, you can expect, uh, in fact, the Bible said, if you be without chastisement, uh, then are you bastards and not sons. You don't belong to the Father if you can go and sin and get, and get by with it and not have judgment on your life. I mean, that's, I'm just telling you Bible truth right there. There's chastisement. So you say, preacher, I don't like when God convicts me. I don't know about you, but Brother Ronnie, I thank the Lord for conviction. I thank the Lord that I can't just do what I want to and get by with it. I thank God that God still checks me. I thank God that whenever I start veering out of the way, God said, hold on. Hold on. I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost puts bumpers on me sometimes and say, we ain't going that way. They're chastised. Uh, let me just, just briefly. He can chastise in several ways. Through, he can chastise your flesh through sickness or sorrow. He can uh, chastise uh, you through your family. He can chastise you through your finances. He can chastise you uh, through your future when you begin to reap the consequences of the seeds you've sown. For what did the Bible say? 
For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I, we may sin, but we will never get away with it. Numbers 32 said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. There's going to be consequences for you and I that are saved by the grace of God if we sin willfully against the things of God. There's a difference, Miss Carolyn, in failing God and rebelling against God. And many times, Jesus, you think about the woman at the well. Uh, nobody had any time for her. Even the disciples thought he ought not be spending any time for her. And she runs back to town and says, Come, see a man which told me all things ever I did. Said everybody else had cast her aside. Everybody else was done with her. Uh, but he had some compassion on her. John chapter number 8. There's a woman that's caught in the very act of adultery. Thrown down at the feet of Jesus. Uh, they said the law says we ought to stone her. What do you say Jesus? He said he that's without a sin among you. Cast the first stone. They start from the oldest to the least. Uh, and they leave. And then he looks at her. And he said go and sin no more. There's a difference between failing God and rebelling against God. God, Proverbs 29. Open your mind. Let me see this. Proverbs 29, I believe it is, and verse number one. Proverbs 29. Let me give you this. It's been a long time since I pulled this one out. Proverbs 29. There it is. Verse number one. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. There's a difference between failing God and rebelling against God. You can play your game. You can do your thing. But God knows when it's time to pull your chain. I didn't even have that wrote down. For you, right? <laughs> you can play your game. You can do your thing. But God knows when it's time to pull your chain. Amen. Go from there. Ah, uh, We cannot live just any old way we want to. Uh, for the Bible said this, uh, that we are constrained by him. I am bought with a price. Uh, I am owned by him. I'm possessed by him. I'm constrained by him. Uh, you can't do, go and do anything you want to and not have the judgment of God come down on you when you do. Uh, don't worry, it's going to really get better. It'll get better. They cry. They did not cry out, rather, in repentance, but they simply cried for deliverance. Look back at verse number, uh, I think it's verse number four. Verse number three, give me verse number three. They cried out because of the situation they were in. They didn't ever seem to realize that if they would just walk with God, if they would just do things God's way, they could have the blessings on their life. But yet they continue went through this cycle day after day, year after year. I mean, it was generation after generation went through the same thing. And it's easy for us to point our finger at them and say, Israel should have known better, but what do we do? We do the same thing. We... We sin until we get called in it, and then we cry out to God, God, please forgive me, God, help me, and then we do right for a little while, then there's something else that gets us. Amen. Oh. Hebrews, let me, let me give you this one. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. <clears throat> and verse number 1, I believe. Uh, yeah, I believe it's verse 1. Hebrews if I have Hebrews in my Bible somewhere here. Come on, I know you're back here. Hebrews, there's Philemon. I'm on this, there it is. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number one. Uh, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run 
with patience that is uh, the race that is set before us. Give me the first part of that one again. The sin that does so easily beset. See, there are there are things in your life. I can tell you right now. Uh, I am not in one instance that I can remember. I've not been tempted to go and get drunk. That's just not something that I deal with. It's not something that I uh, ever had a problem with. But there's people in this room that that's a big temptation for you. That's a problem that uh, you have to deal with and you have to subdue. You have to get up. There's pro there's some of you uh, that you have you have a sin uh, that d the devil knows just how to dangle it right in front of you to get you messed up, tripped up, uh, off out of out of bounds with God. The sin that does so easily beset us. It do us well to learn what is that thing. That gets me tripped up so often. What is it that I do that leads me into that temptation? Um, I've told you this story before, but I'll tell you again. A pastor, uh, a friend of mine, he used to be my pastor many years ago. Uh, he had a problem with drinking. And uh, he got saved and man, he, he was living for God. But there were times that he had a temptation to want to want a drink. And uh he said he knew that if he ate ice cream, he wouldn't want to drink no beer. And uh, I can imagine he might want to drink a beer anyway. Uh, but he knew if he ate ice cream, he wouldn't want to drink a beer. So uh, Raymond, what he would do is whenever he started feeling tempted, his wife worked at a convenience store. Uh, he, he'd, be, he'd done worked all day and he, he's at home and he's thinking, man, a, a cold one would, would hit the spot right about now. He'd get in his truck, he'd ride up to the store and buy the biggest ice cream he could and just eat it. He might have got fat, but he didn't get drunk. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> find out the thing that's bothering you and find out how you can stop that from having a place in the Bible said this, neither give place to the devil. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up. I want to give you uh, the meat of the message here. Uh, look uh, with me there on the next point. Uh, verse number four. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Do I have verse number five as well? And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim and the children of Israel came up uh, to her for judgment. So we see there's a spiritual decline and then we find that there's a special duty that has been given to this judge by the name of Deborah. Deborah is the only female judge that you'll find in the Bible. And I'm not here tonight to get into the uh, the depths of women preachers and all that stuff, I just find I find it very hard uh, that a woman can be a pastor and line up with Second Timothy chapter three, First Timothy chapter two, uh, Titus uh, chapter number one as well. Uh, there's a lot in there that that would definitely uh, tell me that a woman probably would never have a place scripturally being a pastor. But we do know this, if you will, give, give me verse number four. Listen to what the Bible said about uh, Deborah. The Bible said this, she was a prophetess. Remember when Jesus was born? There was a woman by the name of Anna, I believe her name was, and she was a prophetess. And so there was a, a God used, and, and the Bible tells us this, and uh, this right here will mess up some Baptist theology, but Joel chapter number two said uh, that in the latter days your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And you say, well, preacher, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're called to preach. Anybody that tells uh, what God has to say, uh, you are prophesying what God has to say. Uh, there are no uh, modern-day prophets that speak into what's happening in the future. God has said everything he's going to say and wants us to know, and he put it in this book. Uh, he didn't give you no, some special revelation, uh, some new revelation, uh, but what he won't say it came right out of this book. Amen. Amen. Uh, but she had a position. Uh, she was, uh, her, her name uh, literally means a, a bee. 
busy as a bee. Most women that I know, mothers especially, one thing you can't say about most of them is that they're lazy. They're usually busy doing something. And i just be honest with you tonight. I know a whole lot of preachers that are lazy. <laughs> I know a lot of them that just, I, I just saw them. I just, I, I'm just sorry. I'm just going to be honest. They just slack. Won't hardly do nothing. I was over here the other day and I was fixing some stuff and working on some stuff and messing around with stuff. And I was thinking I'm thankful to be a small church pastor. I, I enjoy doing things around the house of God. I enjoy doing things for the Lord. And I know there's a lot of people in here that love to do for the Lord. You wouldn't ever want to get a paycheck for it. You wouldn't ever want to uh, have somebody highlight you because you did it. You just want to do something for God. I believe that Deborah wanted to do something for God. But I also believe the reason that God called Deborah to do something is because there was a bunch of men that would. Well. Uh-huh. There's a bunch of men that would. Brother Robert knows exactly what I'm talking about. He's pastored a couple of churches. He knows if something's going to get done, you better ask a woman to get it done. Uh, that way it can get done. Some dude's going to sit around and talk and him haul and uh, twiddle his thumb. Come on now. <laughs> I figured y'all women ought to help me now. She judged Israel. Now, think about this. I, as, I, as I studied this, I read behind different commentators and one said this and I never thought about it and I think it's good. Give me the uh, next verse, verse number five. The Bible said there that she dwelt under the palm tree of death. Now, you've got this king, Jabin. He's a wicked king. He is pressing down on them. They have no uh, weapons. Remember we, uh, last week we talked about Shamgar, how he took that ox goat and he slew, slew all those people, took all their weapons away. So when God decided he'd raise up somebody, he said, if I use Deborah, that wicked king won't think nothing about people going to Deborah. And people would go to Deborah. The Bible said there, the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. They came and asked her, what ought to we to do in this situation? How ought do we to handle this situation? What do we need to do? And God was using her in a in a, in, a, in a situation she had a special duty that the other judges didn't have. Also, as, as we find out here in just a moment, she had a situation where there was a guy by the name of Barak. And he, and best we can tell, he was the military leader. The military might. He, he led the army side. She's the only judge that didn't necessarily handle the military and the army part. They couldn't have one. They didn't have any weapons. They didn't have any uh, formal army. But here he was. He had some men. And she had this duty that God had given her. And I don't want to uh, get too fast here and, and get beyond this. But she prophesied just exactly what would happen. Look in verse, uh, the Bible tells us there in verse number uh, four that she's a prophetess. Verse number six said, she said, called Barak, son of uh, Abinim, um, out of wherever that is. That's a big old word I'm not going to try to say. And said to him, hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, go and draw toward the Mount Tabor and I take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun, and I drew unto thee, excuse me, I will draw unto thee in the river uh, Kihosh Sierra, uh, Caesarea, uh, the captain of Jabin's army, uh, with his chariots and with his multitude, and I will deliver him 
into thine hand. So she says what God has told her is going to happen. She makes a prophecy, as she, uh, and she ha ha but then there's a problem. He said, I'm not going unless you go with me. Now, he believed in her more than he believed in God. He didn't believe that God would deliver, but said, Deborah, I'll go fight if you go with me. Now, he's got, a he's got a little bit of faith, just wavering faith. Now, listen to what happens. She says, because of that, verse number nine, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. That thou takest shall, uh, excuse me, uh, for the Lord shall sell Caesarea into the hand of a woman. And Deborah rose and went with Barak uh, to Kadesh. Now, so here's the, the problem. Is that there was a spiritual vacuum. There was a vacuum of manhood, of responsibility, of people that would step up and do what they ought to do. Lord, if that's not us in 2021. And I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking about all over this world. Uh, there, there is a, uh, 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 there's a pandemic of fatherlessness. So many children are having to grow up without a dad because dad just won't do it. Dad wants to play the video game. Dad wants to run around. Dad wants to, uh, to have fun. Dad, Dad's not ready to grow up yet. Yeah. In our churches, that continues. Dad's not ready to get serious right now. Dad's not ready to lead right now. Dad's not ready to lead his family in the things of God. There's many women that are leading their family right now because daddy won't do it. Because husband or dad simply won't be the leader that God has called them to be. I'll never forget Miss Carolyn telling me this, and I hope I don't embarrass you, but uh, for years, Miss Carolyn led the choir and the music and all here. And uh, she always told me, once I came and started trying to, to lead and pastor here, she always told me, said, uh, the only reason I did it, because we didn't have a man that would. And if you ever get somebody who wants to, I'll be glad to let them do it. And I'm thankful that God's gave us people over the years that's helped in that. But I want to say thank you for doing it when no man would. When nobody else will. I thank you for stepping up. And you know what? God used you mightily. God helped you uh, and helped us in a great way uh, through your ministry over the years. I, I think about the whole time that I, I was sitting over there pushing slides up and down on the soundboard. It was you that was leading, leading the music over there. And man, we had some services over there in that old building. And, and we had some services over here in this building. And I think about some people that stood, stepped up to the plate and did what they had to do when somebody else wouldn't do it. Can I help y'all young people? Young men especially? Step up and be the man God called you to be. Well, I just want to I just want to focus on work. And I just want to focus on, uh, you know, right now I can ask some of them, how do you do this move in this game? And they'll tell me all the buttons you got to push. A, B, B, A, X, Y. You know, they'll know all that. Where's this in the Bible? Uh, uh, uh. What's the words to that? What's the stats? <laughs> Talk about some dads. What's the stats for your favorite player? They'll tell you all the hits that they had, all the, how many uh, strikeouts they got, they, all that stuff. Where's that in the Bible? Uh. Uh, it's time for us to get serious about things of God. Hey. I saw an article today, Brother Ronnie. I don't know exactly when this happened, but it's been recently. I didn't get the time frame on exactly when it happened. But they're measuring right now on the Temple Mount for the 
new temple. Revel, read this when you get home. Revelation 11, 1, 2, and 3, but 1 and 2 especially. Talks about them measuring and leaving out the time of, of the court of the Gentiles for a time. And in the 42 months after the halfway point of the uh, of tribulation, then uh, that, that, that other part will be brought into play. Uh, but all that happened, Revelation chapter 11, that's happening right now. It's not time to dilly-dally around. It's not time to say, well, I'll get serious about it later. I, I believe there's some dads and some grandpas that are in here and say, I wish I would have got serious about the things of God younger uh, in my life, and I would have been able to lead my children and my family better in my younger days. Uh, it's time for every one of us. I don't care if your mom or your dad. It, it's time for you uh, to get serious uh, about doing the things that God has called you to do. Uh, uh, get serious about the things uh, that God wants you to do. Now, so we see that there is a, a special um, duty that she has. I think about women in the church. Let me just pause right here. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine, and uh, on Mother's Day, Brother Robert knows this is true, on Mother's Day, man, we preach the, uh, we preach heaven is sweet, and we preach the, a message that's just going to uplift and edify people, but on Father's Day, what do we do? We drop the plow. We just let the hammer down. We, we tell them all them dudes just how bad they are. <laughs> yeah, but I do want to say this. I appreciate the women of the church. I appreciate uh, the, the ministry of women in the church. You can often feel overlooked. You can often feel uh, neglected. You can often feel like that you don't matter. But I can tell you this. Anybody who's been around church knows this. If, uh, if things are going to get done, it's going to be the women that are involved, the women that uh, are helping and coming alongside and doing it. And I say thank the good Lord uh, uh, for the women that God has put in this place uh, uh, to labor alongside uh, and to help us uh, and lead in all different kinds of areas. Uh, I think about our children's ministry. Uh, we wouldn't have people teaching kids or anything like that if it was up to a bunch of dudes. Uh, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, when when you think about ministries of compassion and care, and it's going to happen uh, usually through the hand uh, of a woman. Outreach ministries, uh, uh, gifts of grace. Uh, uh, whenever it comes time somebody has a problem, come on and, and we decide we're going to put together a meal. It ain't the dudes that's cooking, put, cooking. It's the women that's helping us uh, that's doing that. I say I thank God for the women in the church. Oh, yeah. She uh, yeah, praise the Lord. You, she she may not have had uh, to do what everybody else did, but she did what God called her to do. Your ministry might not be just exactly what somebody else's is, but do the ministry God calls you to do. I thank the good Lord for people that will do what they can. Um, I think about many people uh, are, are over the over the church and in ministries. I think about there's people that will come over here and do something, and you don't have to worry about check up on them if they gonna do it. They told you they gonna do it. It's gonna get done. Um, I had uh, here a while back. We had a, an issue going on, and uh, we need some extra help outside work. And uh, they didn't think that no, anybody would know, and I'm not going to call their name. Uh, they didn't think anybody would know who did it. But we had a little parking lot ferry out there, uh, cleaning up, picking weeds, uh, getting, getting trash and junk out of the way, and it was a woman. She just said, I'm going to do what I can. And I say, thank the Lord. But here, let me give you this last one. And uh, look uh, with me there in verse no, chapter 5 and verse number 6. You can do the whole chapter, uh, but I'll just give you a, a verse or two here. Uh, in the days of Shemgar, the son of Anath, uh, in the days of Jael, uh, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. 
uh, the inhabitants of the village ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. And so we see here that God raises up Deborah uh, for a certain time and for a certain reason and for a certain season. And uh, he, he uses somebody else. Remember how that uh, he, he said, and I'm not going to go and fight Barak. He said, I'm not going to go and fight unless you go with me, Deborah. Remember that? And, and, she, and the Bible said, all right, that, that's fine. But you won't be able to, uh, to get glory out of this. It won't be you that God uses because of that. And I don't have time to read, the, to read through the story. But here's what happened. <clears throat> they, God sends a, uh, Kelly, you can come to me. God sends a huge rainfall that comes down. You'll have to read most of chapter 5 to, to, to get uh, exactly what all is going on. God sends a huge rainfall. The Bible said that the earth, as they begin to sing this song in chapter number 5, the earth shook. The rain fell. And so they without one weapon, Brother Robert, they without one sword, without a knife, without anything, God gave them the victory. It was a supernatural victory. They had no weapon to, uh, that they had in their hand, but they had faith in their God. Somebody help me now. Uh, they didn't know how they was going to do it, but all they knew that God said he would do it, and they took him at his word. And so they went down there, and God gave them the victory, and they began to sing this song in chapter number five, and they sung this song about how God delivered, and notice, Raymond, what happened. Uh, whenever that happened, the king ran to a tent to this people that were somewhat friendly with Israel. He found this tent of somebody that would hide him, Brother Robert. And the wife, he asked for water and she brings him milk. And that means to him, that man, man, they care about me. They want me here. They're going to take care of me. And he did another thing. It made him sleepy. And he laid down and he went to sleep. And this woman knew that that army of Israel was coming after him. She knew that God had raised up a deliverer. And she knew it was time to get rid of this evil, wicked king. This is interesting, Miss Becky. I, I, I didn't know this or I didn't remember this well. Until I studied about this. In this time frame, the job of a woman, one of the jobs, was to put up and take down the tent. So the Bible tells us that she killed this king with a tent stake and a hammer through his temple. God picked somebody that knew what they was doing with that tent stake and that hammer to take care of the job. And what I'm telling you is this, that I don't know how God will bring it. God may use different means than what you would think, but God will bring the victory in your life. God will deliver. The Bible said this, He does deliver and doth yet deliver. Miss Mary there's more victories ahead. We can shout about what God did. And we can thank God for what He's doing. But we can praise God all as well for what He's going to do. See, the reason I get excited about what He's going to do is because I know what He is doing. And I'm familiar. I'm well acquainted with what He has done. And because He's always been good. Because He's always been faithful. Because He's always come through. Trust him. I believe him. I can know that there's a God that will deliver one more time. So I say, rise up like Deborah. Rise up like Barak and sing. Sing the song of deliverance and say that God has done it again. Stand with me. And she's playing. I wonder.
tonight, how many of us would come and gather around an altar, maybe on the front pew, or maybe just right there where you're at? How many of us would come and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, as I wait for the coming of the King of Kings. Lord, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to praise you for who you are right now. God, I know victory is on the way. I know victory is coming. I can praise you for it. I can thank you, God, for the people that you used, the people that you brought alongside to help in this battle. Lord, I love you, and I thank you tonight. Help us, oh God, to be used like Deborah in a time where we look around and our world is in decline. Our world is in a mess. May God we be used especially to do a work for you. God, may we ever sing of your praise, sing of your victory, tell of your story. You are worthy here tonight. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done. Lord, all that you will do. God, touch these needs tonight. These that have special burdens in their heart, burdens in their life. I pray, oh God, that you do for them what only you can do. Lord, we believe in you. God, for salvation in the lives of those that are lost. We're believing you, God, for deliverance in the lives of those that are in bondage. God, you've done it for us. Lord, I know you can do it for them. Lord, have your will and have your way. Thank you, Jesus, for all you, you are doing. God, we want to tell you thank you for all that, God, you have done. Lord, we worship you. But Lord, we believe you and we praise you, God, for what you're going to do yet. Oh, God, as we stand, as maybe this man Brat did, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Give us faith to believe. Lord, we ask these things in the name that is above every name in Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for uh, coming out to be with us, Ian. I appreciate you doing that. If you come prepared to give tonight, he'll be just hanging out right there. Drop that in the plate, and uh, he'll, he'll take care of that. Uh, we'll be here on Sunday, uh, 10 o'clock, for those of you that uh, want to come out to Bible study. We'll be over in the Fellowship Hall. Plenty of room over there. Uh, you could probably just sit uh, by yourself or with your family at a table. Plenty of room to be able to do that. And so that's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll, we'll be having worship. And so be sure to be here on the 24th, Lord willing. Uh, we don't have any kind of weather or anything like that. Uh, Ben's family, uh, there's a CD that says Ben's family on there. Did you see that? I'll get her to play it as we're leaving. Uh, we've got some CDs if you want to get one of those. But they're going to be here with us on the 24th. And uh, we appreciate uh, the ministry that Ben had here. And uh, I want you to pray about this. Went back there in our parking lot uh, time. What, what they did for us helped me tremendously. Uh, ben had set up their sound system. We used it for months. And it helped me so much in being able to just come in, set up real quickly, and get that taken out, and uh, us to be able to try to uh, do the best we could. And they never charged us, didn't ask for a love offer, or nothing. But I want you to pray about what you can do uh, to be a blessing to them when they're here on the 24th. Uh, not to pay them back for that, but to bless them uh, for what they did. And so uh, you pray about that. And uh, if you've got something that you can give special, 
uh, toward that, then we certainly uh, want to be able to be a blessing to them. All right? Um, I think that's it. Let's, uh, let's be dismissed. We'll have a word of prayer as we're dismissed. Uh, ask if you will. Um, let's have Brother Glenn, if you will, you pray for us. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful message. God has supplied to our lives. God, I pray for every prayer request.